All righty, guys. Um, welcome to CPR week one. Um, I know CPR is a big departure from MSK, and I just want to give you guys this little preface by saying where anatomy and um, everything that you covered in MSK was uh, so heavily, heavily focused in on making sure you guys remembered random details. CPR is more physiology heavy. The material that you're going to cover is going to be primarily focused on how systems interact with each other. And it's not just purely like, can I remember parts of the heart? Of course, there's always going to be anatomy thrown in since you guys are learning systems, but make sure you guys make a mental picture, whiteboard, do some active recall when possible, because this material is harder to kind of work with if you're just working at it in isolation. As always, I'm a big proponent of group studying, so make sure you guys do that. And that being said, let's get this ball rolling. Little housekeeping rules. I'm a very like chill type of dude in general. So feel free to message me in the group chat. I believe we're gonna have a co-facilitator very soon. Um, and guess what? You guys are gonna be using Turning Point. Yes, I know. It's not only SGU who can use Turning Point. Um, feel free to sign in. The session ID is lubdub s one s 2 I know it's a very long session ID, but there wasn't any other cool ones that I could use. So feel free to sign in. Um, and we have some questions along the way, as well as content that I'm gonna cover with you guys. So don't worry, it's gonna be a good um, session and uh, it's gonna cover all of week one, hopefully the high yields. All right, let's do this. As always, we run Here's the TPLG. I just want to tell you guys, it's a great little resource, a group that's just dedicated to helping um, lower termers and upper termers kind of get through the material. Um, we have multiple kind of sessions planned out for different terms, so feel free to sign up for those. And we have advice slash Q&A panels whenever we can. Um, cool. So here is a little um, scan thingamabob. What I'm going to tell you guys, make sure you guys scan this so that you guys can um, get access to our Facebook group. I'll approve you guys as soon as possible. Obviously, I'm a busy student as well, but um, I try to stay on top of this material and, um, and make sure that the group is run as efficiently as possible. Um, and we have access to a Google Drive that has a um, bunch of helpful resources, practice questions, um, resources we used uh, as uh, as students ourselves um, when we were going through this material. So make sure you guys do that um, when you guys can. Alrighty, let's get this ball rolling. So first thing you guys have to remember that the cardiovascular system is a system. It's not just connected to itself, right? So it, it's connected to everything that you guys know about the human body and that you've spent some time learning. Everything is divided, I like to think, in series of pumps, right? Like, And it's like two separate pumps, but they have to work in tandem to make sure that you guys are alive and functioning well. Important to note is that the cardiovascular system, right, is divided based off of the heart. Everything that is left-sided is primarily focused in on getting systemic circulation, right? It's, it helps you move everything along to the appropriate tissue and make sure that those tissues are getting the sufficient oxygen nutrients that you need to keep you alive and functioning well. Now, what happens to the right side of your heart? Your right side of your heart is primarily focused on the pulmonary system. And it's, it's basically the receiving point for everything else from the body, right? It's all deoxygenated blood primarily, and it's going into pulmonic circulation so that it can eventually get oxygenated. Now, that is really important. If you guys divide the heart into left and right, it will make your life so much easier in terms of understanding this, this material, okay? Um, as always, remember this side, right? The, the left-hand side, very oxygenated, very rich. And if you guys notice, the left ventricle is much thicker because it has to basically pump out all of the blood and the resistance that comes with it at the aorta, right? The aorta is, is primarily the, is the crucial point that holds almost the entire body's worth of pressure. And that's why we often take the pressure of the aorta in order to see how the overall systemic 
pressure or hypertensive or hypotensive a patient is. And it's very critical that you guys know that because um, it tells you how the heart works and why a certain portion of the heart is so much bigger versus the other side of the heart. And we just finished covering you know, CPR in clinical context in term four, and so much of this material comes back. So I want to make sure you guys learn it like a story as compared to just, you know, memorizing that the heart has four chambers and then just kind of walking through it. As always, make sure you guys run through this um, both conceptually and via whiteboarding or Anki if you guys are using that. It helps a lot. All righty. Um, next thing you guys need to know is that the system is divided into two pumps, right? Primarily, everything runs in series. And the reason why it runs in series is because it's just blood moving from one location to the other, right? You don't really have to worry about too much pressure because the pressure can be managed by the um, composition of your vessels, right? But remember, you if, just because there's a high pressure system doesn't mean those are going to be preferred by your organs. Because if you have too much high pressure, those organs can actually be damaged by that pressure. There can be too much movement of fluids into those organs. It can lead to severe changes in terms of both anatomy and physiology of the organs. And you can go into end organ failure, which is something you learn in term four. Now, like I mentioned, left heart, right? Composed of two chambers, right? Left atrium, left ventricle, and it, it's primarily oxygenated blood that you're worried about here. And that has to go into systemic circulation, right? It goes to the body. And that's really important that you guys remember that. Um, and remember that the capillaries are actually in parallel as compared to in series for everything else, okay? That's really important because that's how your organs kind of essentially work um, in, in order to relieve some of the pressure in having these capillaries in parallel, okay? Whereas the left side of the heart, like I mentioned, right atrium, um, right ventricle, deoxygenated blood, and that goes to pulmonary circulation. And you guys are gonna learn pulmonary pathology much later, but you guys do need to know what happens at the lung level that can potentially mess with the heart, okay? Coolio, let's move right along. Like I mentioned, parallel in terms of blood vessels, right? You guys can see how everything has to be in parallel at the end organ level, right? The brain, the kidneys, the gut. And the reason why you have this is because you can tightly regulate your um, major arteries that are going to the organs based off of vasoconstriction, vasodilation, right? Now, it's about balancing your resources like everything else in life, right? Your brain might need a whole bunch of oxygen going to it constantly. So it doesn't really need too much vasodilation, vasoconstriction, et cetera. But let's say you just had a nice burger um, and your body needs to digest and metabolize all of this food and resources that's coming in. So your body has to vasodilate and everything else has to, has to vasoconstrict, right? That's why, you know, they, they tell you not to work out after you, you know, have a nice meal because it, it causes these systemic level changes and it can mess with your, um, your limbs, right? Because your limbs are, need a lot of blood when you're working out as compared to when you're rest and digesting. And this really comes into the perspective of sympathetics and parasympathetics, okay? Remember, if blood flow to each organ is added, um, overall, it's about like, five liters per minute of like pressure and volume kind of flowing through this area. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's a lot um, of pressure to kind of deal with. And that's why having it in parallel helps maintain that pressure. And um, you can tightly regulate it in terms of the cardiac output and where everything goes, right? If you guys can see the primary hoggers of most things is liver, gut, um, skeletal muscle, brain, and kidney. Everything else is superfluous. Look at how tiny the heart kind of receives blood from its own kind of circulatory system. It's tiny. It's a fraction. And yet it's so giving, right? The heart is so beautiful. It's so romantic. I love that. Um, although it's the wrong season for that. Happy Halloween to anyone who's in the state side. If not, um, no worries. Halloween is like almost universally kind of recognized as this like random holiday that's kind of thrown in there. 
Now, important that you guys know this, okay? Whenever you guys see a little hard slide or kind of um, this image, it's high yield. You got to know these values or anything that's presented on these slides. Overall, everything that I'm giving to you guys is high yield material, but just know this one very well, okay? Stroke volume is end diastolic volume versus end systolic volume. It's the amount of volume that your blood, uh, uh, sorry, amount of volume um, that of blood that is ejected from your heart. And that's really important, right? Because it tells you um, what type of parameters you're working with. Let's say your heart kind of goes into failure, right? Heart failure, your stroke volume actually goes down, right? Your end diastolic volume changes, your end systolic volume increases because your heart is no longer able to sufficiently do that ventricular squeeze that gets the um, blood moving from the ventricles. Ejection fraction is the fraction of the end diastolic volume that's ejected with each stroke volume. And basically it tells you um, the stroke volume and the end diastolic volume and how much of it is actually squeezed out, right? That's the volume that's ejected, right? That's critical to you guys remember that these values are tested on your exam. It's a guaranteed question essentially. Cardiac output, very simple. This formula will come time and time again. Um, it's the essential output of the stroke volume times the heart rate. Now your sympathetics and the parasympathetic lectures come in handy with this is because a lot of your ionotrophic and um, your overall like increasing heart rate can potentially change the stroke volume as well. So you can increase your cardiac output. And it makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, when you're working out or when you're rest and digesting, you don't need your heart to work too much. Whereas when you're working out, you need your heart to work extra hard, get a lot more blood to kind of move and pass any sort of um, nutrients as well as take out any sort of gunk that you don't need, right? Such as um, lactic acid and other things that you're gonna cover later on. Let's cover histology real quick. Um, and I know there's a couple of questions in here, so make sure you guys sign in and I will throw a timer on here. And I'll try to keep it short, 30, 30 seconds, so. Also, um, I believe our co-facilitators here, um, Kate, do you wanna quickly introduce yourself? Hi guys, I'm Kate. Um, Kishore is your leader here. I am just in the chat. If you have any questions, I can help answer them, but Kish is your guy. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, for joining. I am having these little sessions and I usually have a co-facilitator just so that any sort of questions that come in um, and like if I lose my voice halfway through and I need someone to cover for me, Kate's got me. Um, she'll perform CPR and, uh, you know, it'll be a whole Grey's Anatomy scene if you guys are into that. Okay. You guys are absolutely correct. Lovely. As always, it is atherosclerosis. And this is, um, make sure you guys sign in. The session ID is lubdub S1, S2. I know I didn't throw S3. I know S3 often gets left out. It feels kind of lonely, but it's working on itself. And one day it'll get added to the turning point session ID. Okay. It's atherosclerosis. Now remember, arteriosclerosis is a little different. Atherosclerosis, something myself and Kate know very well from our CRS module, it really messes with, um, it's, it's essentially plaque, right? Whenever they say, you know, your, your, heart, your arteries are clogged up with gunk, um, whether a doctor is kind of like explaining in very lay, layman's term, it's essentially atherosclerosis. Um, it's when you have the deposition of LDL, right? based off of like changes to the actual membrane of your arteries, right? And it causes changes and especially it tears through the intima and gets into the media. And you guys are like intima media. I know these terminologies. What is he talking about? It's because these layers are so fragile because it's like essentially the first layer, right? I like to think of it um, as like just layers that protects your vessels from rupturing um, and they all have a function to them. Atherosclerosis is straight up a lesion of the tunica intima, right? Intima is the first layer. Then there's the media. 
and then there's the adventitia. So remember that, run that through your guys' head. Very, very, like, it's really important because that, that concept of intima, media, and adventitia will come back time and time again. We even saw it during our module, just like literally three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks ago. So it's atheromas, fibrotic um, fatty plaques. The pathway you guys, I think, covered in FTM, um, if I'm not mistaken. Remember, it's the deposition of LDL. Macrophages gobble it up, and it converts it into these fibro fatty plaques that hardens the vessels, right? It, it hardens and if essentially gets to a point where it weakens the functionality of the vessels, and it potentially can even occlude. And the important thing to note is that there's about like levels of occlusion and you know your body hits to a certain threshold like let's say 70 percent occlusion and it will then if essentially cause ischemic changes or damage to the location and organs that you're working with make sure you guys know that part um not the 70 percent that's like a later problem but for now that it can potentially lead to obstruction um, and the closure of the vascular lumen, okay? Now, arteriosclerosis, unfortunately, is a non-malignant kind of change that comes based off of when you age, right? Unfortunately, we're all decaying like the mummies that we are, um, and the hardening happens with calcification, right? Your arteries eventually calcify. And if you guys, you know, go into surgery or anesthesiology, and you're trying to pump the patient full of um, anesthetics, often if it's an older patient, they're going to have a hard time getting into the arteries because of the fact that um, it's not just the arteries, it can even happen to the veins too. If the plaques, um, they're not plaques, remember these are hardening of the actual vessels, so it's hard to puncture through them and deliver the anesthetics that you need to eventually put the patient under. So I've seen in a lot of ORs, luckily the patient... Um, <laughs> is typically alive and they're given like a local like topical anesthetics when they're trying to do these punctures. But like I've seen like the ER or sorry, OR floor kind of get spread with blood because of the fact that they have such a hard time puncturing um, into the vessels. All right, like I covered with you guys, it's LDL, right? Um, they really don't care about the triglycerides and lipids. That's like a later problem for when you guys in term two. Um, but what you need to know is that LDL is the primary cause. It rips through the intima, which is the first layer, gets into the media, like in between the intima and the media. Your macrophages are like, oh my God, I got tissue damage. And then they just arrive and they're like, I'm going to gobble all this stuff up. And basically they, um, they, they become foam cells, right? These foamy cells don't know what to do with themselves. So um, it just starts working to um, block everything, right? It basically creates a little bubble that helps isolate it from um, spreading too far. But the problem is that the protective factors are going to eventually lead to um, occlusion, right? These macrophages are doing what they're normally doing, which is gobbling stuff up and destroying, but they can't really destroy LDL too well because they're not like your adipocytes or other cells, and they lead to essentially these um, fatty plaque streaks, okay? Um, remember that the smooth muscles are also involved in this, so got to keep that one in mind. Let's do this question. And hopefully I'll try not to lose my voice today. Just so everyone knows, we're doing using turning point. So feel free to sign in. Don't worry, you're not gonna lose professionalism points. I won't tell SGU. Okay, um, we had a little bit of distribution and I completely get why, um, because this often uh, can be confusing. So what are we looking at here? What kind of, um, feel free to unmute and just yell at me too. Like, I love that, okay. Um, what type of tissue are we looking at? Skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, right? Now the important thing is with skeletal muscle, it's one of the one of the kind of key components that needs to be separated from your vasculature. And that sounds kind of weird. You're like, 
why do you want to have so much separation between your vasculature? Because your vasculature and your blood supply have a lot of different ions and things associated with them that can literally tweak your muscles, right? I'm not talking about like metaphorical tweaking. Like I'm talking about real tweaking. Your muscles will spasm out if um, these ions that are in the blood pop into these actual um, myocytes, right? So Important to note that in the skeletal muscle, you're gonna have endothelial cells with tight junctions and a continuous basal lamina, right? It's hella protected, right? And I just wanna emphasize this, you guys gotta know all of these very cold, right? You need to know your continuous somatic capillaries, right? You need to know your fenestrated visceral capillaries and the discontinuous sinusoidal. Now, I'm a big proponent of not memorizing anything in life because ain't nobody got time for that. And two, if you learn it like a story, it helps you remember it much better. So remember with continuous and somatic, it's so well protected, right? Look at, look at all the locations where it's so protected. Connective tissue, muscle tissue, nerve tissue, exocrine glands, and cerebral cortex. It makes sense, right? Because all of these organs need to be separated from the blood and all of the ions and stuff that are floating around there. Obviously you want simple diffusion to still happen so they, these tissues can you know, get oxygenated and stay alive, but you don't want them to you know, get access to a bunch of other stuff. Whereas you're fenestrated, right? It has a continuous basal lamina with tight junctions still, but it has these kind of opening pores, right? They have like little um, fenestrations. That's exactly what, it, what the name sounds and um, location of it makes a lot of sense because you want stuff to pass through much easier, right? You can think about your ciliary process of your eyes, right? You need your, your, um, your aqueous humor to kind of make sure that they don't just hang out in one location, cause a buildup of pressure, and eventually you, you know, getting glaucoma, right? You also have it in the choroid plexus, um, that's in the ventricles. And if you guys remember, well, actually my term twos, you guys are covering NB, it makes sense why we see fenestrated capillaries here because you want your CSF to eventually um, diffuse back into your blood so that any sort of extra lymphatic uh, fluids can drain normally, right? Then you have a kidney and your glomeruli, right? It makes sense because you need to filter out some stuff. I like to think of the fenestrations as like little filters. Now, that's really important because big macro stuff have to pass through from the uh, vasculature into the urine, right? Or eventually the concentration of the urine. Same thing with your GIT gastrointestinal system. All of this is going to make sense when you guys get to term two even further on. Okay. Discontinuous is very, I, I believe it's the easiest one because it needs to be dealing with big chunky stuff, right? Liver produces so much protein so many charged particles and all sorts of other things that it needs to have very big open pores. So liver, spleen, and bone marrow. Think about it in terms of bone marrow, we're learning hematology, oncology right now, and we're crying about it. It makes sense why we have discontinuous because all of these cells are just spit out into the vasculature and the blood eventually leading to um, the production of what we know as RBCs, and uh, the development of your immune system. So really important that you guys remember that. And we had questions about this galore based off of just tissues and where everything is happening, okay? I've given you guys the highlights, okay, of what which ones you need to know. They're all here. Um, memorize this cold and you should be good. Okay, let's do this one. I think we straight up got this image on our exam. Just a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I don't see um, an answer choice on turning point for E. Like it only goes up to Ooh, D. My bad, okay. Well, um, that's awkward. We're gonna assume that you guys are all correct in picking um, in A, which is uh, your tunica media, which is E, right? My bad. Um, let me, next time I'll make sure I get the polling correct. Um, it is the tunica media that you guys are looking here. And that's really important, right? And the reason I'm emphasizing this so much is because it tells you what vessel you're working with. Um, this is absolutely correct. Um, 
thoracic aorta is examined, right, um, we can actually tell you what type of disorder that the patient is having here. Um, CRS is coming back and it's bringing me so much trauma. So this is the aorta. Now, if you guys remember back to your FTM knowledge, Marfan syndrome, right, is associated with this, right? Um, oops, why is everything blue? Um, and what we're looking at in the tunica media is that you have these elastic fibers, right? Your elastic fibers help with the recoil and dealing with the pressure of the heart as it in ejects the high pressure, high volume of blood into the circulation system. Your aorta basically has to deal with all of this, right? It has to deal with the pressure incoming, and then it has to come back to its um, natural state after each ventricular ejection, right? So most of the time, I'm not going to tell you guys to memorize, but it might be helpful to remember 40 to 70 layers of elastic lamellae. And the fact that with Mar Marfan syndrome, this um, fibrillin, right? protein, it gets messed up. Okay. Remember it's fibrillin. Don't put elastin. It's a common trip up for a lot of people. Just remember it's uh, fibrillin that's messed up. It's a autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Um, aortic dissections are common with this. Patients are going to present with like seven foot, like they look like Kobe Bryant, but like they have arachnodactyly, like their fingers are super long. Um, everything is just like proportions wise, way too large. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Layers, as always, the first layer that you're working with is the intima. Then of course the media, which is the means by which it, everything deals with. You can have muscles here as well, which is what I'm kind of outlining smooth muscles and then adventitia, which is the last protective layer. And you guys kind of see this, right? These like red, red, like little things are actually blood vessels. And you're thinking, wait, what? Why does the aorta have blood vessels like associated with them? Um, if you guys think back, I don't know if you guys cover this, but like there's a vasovasorum, which is <laughs> weird as it is to say, vasovasorum, which is is essentially vasculature that gives va vasculature supply to big arteries, right, and veins. Um, typically, I think it's just uh, arteries. Not sure about the veins part. So just make sure that you guys remember. Um, certain organs and vasculature have vasovasorums and um, as well as like a vaso nervosum, which is like basically they give you um, in terms of innervation to your arteries, right? Obviously, these are not like somatic um, nerves. They're more visceral in nature. So just keep that in mind, right? That's why I'm just kind of outlining that so that you guys have your cumulative knowledge very well. All righty, let's do this question. And hopefully I get my turning point sorted out. All right, lovely. Nicely done, guys. Um, as always, I just want to emphasize um, form in our body deals with function. So here we're looking at muscular artery, right? Because remember, the external carotid is a branch off of the aorta, um, which we've seen. And for those in NB, remember, this is dealing with um, your facial muscle or blood supply. And we're going to cover that for you guys when you guys are in term two. But this is really important. You guys see how chunky and thick this um, artery is. B is more of your elastic kind of aortic kind of artery. Don't worry about it right now. Um, make sure you guys just cover histology so that this is the way that SGU likes to ask the questions. And let me just quickly run through muscular artery, elastic for B, small arteries right here. Um, D is a large vein. I know that can, that can trip up a lot of people. And then E is a medium vein. All right. Um, I just want to emphasize this. Uh, it kind of throws people into a loop as to what you, you need to remember with the post capillary venules. Um, it, and they just kind of threw this random fact at you. And you're like, why do I need to know this? The reason you need to know this is because 
postcapillary venules are the location sites where your actual immune complexes and cells can enter, right? Really important whenever you're trying to deal with inflammation or any sort of infection that's come in, your postcapillary venules are the location where your lymphocytes and your neutrophils and everything migrate into. So really important, know this one. Um, just know that it's high endothelial vessels um, and you, you should be good. And if you guys are seeing this, this is actually, um, for those who have already covered inflammation, there's the migration, there's the rolling and all of those things. That's what you're seeing right here. And you're seeing at different levels, things have moved in, right? That's why it looks like, why do, why do, why do all these look like cuboidal cells? They're not cuboidal cells. They're stuff moving into the um, extravascular space. Okay, cool. Um, I threw this in one here um, because we had a question on Marfan syndrome, um, and I told you guys it comes back, all the stuff you guys covered in FGM, and what you need to know is, remember, autosomal dominant, inheritance pattern, um, it's fibrillin, okay, um, that's affected, and it most often presents with a, a, a cardiac level issue. Um, we've seen aortic dissections a lot more when you guys get later on in your time here at SGU. But um, remember, it cuts through the media, okay? This is the part that trips up a lot of people. You're like, wait, how did it get into the media? It's because of the fact that elastin is the part that's messed up, right? Elastin uh, fibers are messed up. Now, your varicose veins are kind of important too. It's basically um, your veins in general have to deal with the fact that it has to be not only squeezing to get blood back to the heart, but it also has to deal with the fact that um, you need to have essentially one way valves, right? When these valves are failing, they essentially collapse and they let the blood that's naturally um, wanting to go downwards due to gravity kind of um, hang out, right? And the and thing is, Whenever you're dealing with veins, it's going to allow for things to dilate and your veins can hold a lot of blood. And most of the blood in our body actually hangs out in veins. And we don't often use the full kind of measure of blood that's hanging out there. We only allow a portion of it to return to the heart based off of whatever parameter you're working with. Alrighty, I see a question. What's up, James? Hmm. You had said on orphan syndrome, it's a laceration to the tunica media, but on the... The um, captions here, it says a laceration to the tunica intima. Yeah, so it cuts through the intima, but they really like to make sure that you guys know that the media is affected, right? You, They want you to know that the media is where the, um, well, you guys are going to cover this, hematoma is basically lodging and creating this wedge, okay? Know that one part. The intima, you guys, you guys can make sense of that, right? Because like it has to cut through the first layer to get into the media. That's why I wanted to um, emphasize the media portion because that's what they like to ask in terms of the dissection. All righty, we had another question. Stephanie, I believe. Yeah, it's not a question exactly, but I was a little bit tripped up with the Marfan syndrome with elastic and the fibrillin. And yep. so the way that I was able to remember it is so I think of it like a scrunchie. So mm -hmm. on the outside of the scrunchie, you've got the, the cloth that protects the inside elastic. So fibrillin is like the cloth part of the scrunchie and the elastic is the inside. If you don't have the outside protecting the elastic, then that's how things can get split and torn. So that's how I remembered it. Exactly. And feel free to share more of it. I, I'm a firm believer of both mnemonics, acronyms, and any quirky ways of keeping things in mind, because trust me, during the exam, when you guys are stressed out, it helps a ton, ton, just to remember a random analogy or an example someone's given. Thank you for that. All righty, let's do the next question. Perfect. You were, we were just talking about Marfan's. I love that. What a great timing. I'm expecting 100% with rockets, okay? I expect rockets. Please tell me you guys have had Dr. Toledo already. 
All right, close enough. I'll take a 93. I know, I know. Can't We can't always have rockets. But yes, this is the Tunica Media. You guys are absolutely correct. Um, make sure you guys remember this one. The numbers, for some reason, um, often can be challenging for a lot of folks. I honestly just looked at them every day until it stuck with me. Um, but as always, I'm a firm believer of not memorizing anything. Just use it based off a of function, and you guys are going to be solid. Nice. All right, um, a little bit of self-study because I don't, I'm not going to um, make sure that you guys just like hear me talk for the entire kind of session. Um, I kind of put these slides together to make sure that you guys cover each of the different layers. Obviously, um, this is an elastic kind of artery, right? Something that you would see in the aorta and you have your muscular and you guys can see that you can see a whole bunch of smooth muscle in the media, right? That tells you that these are muscular kind of arteries. And then you have your small arteries literally has nothing other than a little bit of um, a little bit of media and a mostly adventitia. And then finally you get to your arterioles, tiny, tiny, like literally just a lining, that's it. Um, so just run through these together and just a little self-practice always helps in terms of histology. All righty, um, let's kind of take a quick peek through this. Why do we need to know this? Um, Wabel palate bo bodies are associated with this. Now, you're like, why do I need to know these Weibel palate bodies? Uh, I'm fortunately, when you guys get to later terms, it's involved with your coagulation cascade, which is something you guys are going to cover even in CPR. Um, Weibel palate bodies are, are notorious and involved in the, cap, uh, in the capillary involvement of coagulation kind of cascade. Now, this is a continuous kind of capillary. Now, what tells you that it's because of the fact that you have such tight junctions and it's not allowing things to kind of pass through. Here, these little kind of pores or kind of slots where you don't have any access, this is a fenestrated, right? Fenestrated, make, make sure you guys essentially write down in the white space below what locations you guys are having these type of capillaries. And then finally here, you guys can run through your sinusoidal. You can see all this kind of opening. Histology tends to be a big problem for a lot of folks because it's just a picture, right? You have to remember a picture. But um, what I always do is whenever I, before I go into an exam, um, literally the night before, I look at all of the histology from every single small group. I just commit it to short-term memory, and then I blissfully forget about it until I have to hold a next review session. I'm just kidding, but like most of these have stuck with me because I now know the form and the function of them and what I'm what I need to look for look out for. Exactly. I put you guys all the info here. Obviously, your little homework for the day is to fill out all the information below. Okay. Um, what did I tell you guys? These are migratory. Um, lymphocytes, right, which is something you guys are going to cover much later in depth. Um, they say are post-capillary venules. Now, this is a medium vein. Um, why you need to know this is because varicose veins are associated with this. Um, you can actually go in and obliterate these veins if they're, you know, if they get too out of hand. Um, and then finally, you have your large veins. This is just something I randomly put into memory. And then this is a aortic dissection. It cuts through the intima, gets into the media. Media is the important one to um, just keep in mind. Alrighty, most of it's there. Run through histology based off of disorders. I'm a firm believer of never memorizing anything. All right, mediastinum. I know you guys love anatomy. Trust me, I love anatomy too. Um, I'm kidding. I like anatomy, but I don't like love it until I have to like memorize it. Let's do this question. Give you guys a little bit longer because I know these question stems are getting thicker than the elastic artery. Little bit of advice um, for your term one stuff. So much of it becomes buzzword heavy. Okay. Patient comes in, bloody sputum. This clearly is a sign of an upper respiratory infection. I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's looking at this and like, nope, I don't want to think about it. 
please don't tell me about upper respiratory infections. I'm totally with you. Um, now, it's mostly because of the fact that there's hoarseness. That's a buzzword for you guys. Now, what are you thinking of? It is the left recurrent um, laryngeal nerve, right? Now, why you need to know this is because of the fact that you can have potentially an aortic level change dealing with um, the recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve. And I'm gonna show you guys why that's important. Remember that the recurrent laryngeal for my term twos that are here, it's a form of almost like, I think it's like the firm, uh, form of a the vagus nerve. So it comes down um, and the it does a little loop-de-loop. -loop. And the loop-de-loop -loop is unique to which side of the uh, body that you're working with. The left one, actually loops underneath the aortic arch, right? And then it swoops up and goes to the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. And then it allows for your vocal cords to essentially vibrate and produce sound, right? And what I'm doing right now is essentially damaging my posterior cricoarytenoid by just yelling into Zoom, okay? I'm kidding. I like to make jokes like this so that it sticks better in your guys' head. Um, but the recurrent laryngeal and sort of aortic dissection or trauma to the aorta can actually be severed and damaged. And that can lead to vocal presentation. And this is classic, right? It's really important that you guys need to um, associate hoarseness, recurrent laryngeal. Most often they're going to ask you about the left one because you guys are covering CPR. The right one is more so involved with any sort of... Um, superior vena cava level um, issues, right? That one, you guys are gonna cover it later on. For now, just associate it with the left one, okay? You guys can run through all of the other vasculature, but just know the important ones, like the fact that there's the esophageal plexus that's involved with like, I don't know, um, feeling that you have food stuck in your kind of throat. That's really important. It's a kind of a branch off of the vagus as well. Um, then there's like a bunch of other ones. There's the really, really, really important one, which is the phrenic, okay? Phrenic, it literally gives innervation to the diaphragm, keeps you alive, keeps you respirating, okay? Essential to know that one, okay? And it's also involved with um, any sort of heart level issues because it can then go present with um, well, radiating pain to a different location. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on telling you guys all the information based off of one picture because I have a whole bunch of stuff to cover with you guys. Let's do this one. See. I like sometimes I even forget putting together these slides and I just start giving you guys answers to questions and I'm like, are you kidding me? All righty. So you guys are correct. Um, aortic arch, right? So what are we likely looking at, right? It's the phrenic nerve, right? Um, now, the important thing to note is that it's associated with pain over the left shoulder, shoulder, and that's a radiating pain. It's a referred pain because of the fact that whenever you're having aneurysm at the aorta, right, um, and as well as um, any sort of pain to the that's radiating out, it's because of the fact that the phrenic is associated with um, your breathing, right, your respiratory rate, right, um, as well as a little bit of the um, heart. I'm gonna cover that in a bit, but for now, just know that the phrenic is also involved with any sort of changes to the um, respiratory pattern. You guys are gonna cover pathology much more. Um, to the forearm, I'm gonna cover that. Make sure, oh, I don't wanna give you guys too much of the answers, but phrenic, look at the way it kind of descends, right? It's a branch like the vagus, it comes down, it goes through the pericardial kind of area. It provides innervation. And then eventually it goes to um, other, I mean, it goes to the diaphragm. And then eventually if there's any sort of pain at the heart level, as well as the diaphragm, it's going to be a referred pain. Okay. Questions? I just have a quick question. I know in that one, you mentioned the aortic arch, and I kind of associate that with the recurrent pharyngeal left side. Mm -hmm. But is the key thing to do phrenic here because of the dyspnea? Yes. Yeah. It was a dyspnea that I wanted 
you guys to like focus in on. The thing is the left shoulder is kind of a, a, a like a generalized place where a lot of things can go. Um, I can tell you guys, you can even have left shoulder pain, pain with even spleen level involvement. And you're like, what the heck is a spleen and why am I trying to learn it right now? But it's because of the fact that the spleen is so tightly nestled against the diaphragm that it can actually have presentation by irritating the phrenic nerve and it can have left shoulder pain. And you're like, oh my God, the patient's dying. Nope, it's just because of the fact that they have splenomegaly. But for now, dyspnea associated with the fact that it's pulmonary issue and the fact that um, it's messing with the diaphragm because the phrenic nerve descends downwards, provides innervation to the pericardium as well as innervation to the diaphragm. Okay, know that one cold and it'll help you a lot. Okay. Madeline, do you have any follow-up? I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. No, you're not. No, that was it. Thank you so much. Yep, yeah, no problem. All righty, let's do this question. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Please know what Kate just put in the chat for those who are going to be watching this recording. Phrenic 345 keeps the diaphragm alive, right? And when you guys actually, yeah, you guys already covered that. So you guys should know that one very well for your MSK as well as your cumulative knowledge. So high yield keeps the diaphragm alive. 345. Actually, I'll give you guys some more time because I keep blabbing away. To my T2s that are here, I'm most definitely confabulating. So there's clear indications of a thymine deficiency. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, all righty. Okay. So the herniations are, are, can be quite difficult for a lot of people, okay? Now, the important thing to note is that the chest X-ray shows a retrocardial, right, gas-filled structure, right? It's behind the heart and gas-filled structure. So what are you likely looking at? Herniation of the esophagus through the hiatus of T10. Now, can either my T2s or the T1s that are on this call throw the mnemonic for remembering um, how to remember all of the kind of openings into the diaphragm? So there's the mnemonic I8, 10, eggs at 12. So esophagus would be T10. Perfect, that's the important one. I want you guys to know this mnemonic, like little saying cold because I8, 10, eggs at 12, high, high yield, okay? Um, I love that you guys still remember it to my T2s that are on the call. You guys are killing it for BSCE. I8, right? Read as eight, right? Not eight, okay? 10 eggs at 12, okay? Inferior vena cava penetrates at the T8 level, esophagus T10, and the aorta is at T12. And this is really, really high yield, guys. I straight up use this mnemonic like three times on the exam for my CPR, okay? Know this one cold, know which portion um, actually penetrates through the diaphragm. And when you guys are getting to the congenital stuff where the diaphragm gets messed up, you guys are going to see that it's going to help you a lot with um, answering these questions. Okay. Know this one through a nice picture in because SGU was like, I'm not going to give you guys nice pictures. And I was like, no, you got to have like 1080p non blurry images. So important to know the superior metastinum, the organs tend to confuse a lot of people. Um, not because of the fact that you guys don't know what organs are and where they are. It's because of the fact that they like to ask random questions with the superior mediastinum, anterior mediastinum, middle mediastinum, and the posterior mediastinum. The thing is, is that I'm going to tell you guys the high yields. Okay. Let's say a patient comes in, I don't know, they like fall on a cactus and their superior mediastinum is penetrated. What is likely messed up? The thymus. Okay. I don't know why they just like that random tidbit of information thymus is involved, okay? Um, you can potentially mess up some vasculature. You can mess up some nerves. Um, you can mess up a lot of things. But what you need to know is the thymus is typically the one that they like to ask about that for the superior mediastinum. The anterior one, 
It's not too crazy because um, there's not too much going on. It's such a small space. There's the internal thoracic vessels um, that's giving blood supply to the thoracic wall, as well as the, if you guys remember back to your MSK knowledge, all you need to remember is that um, <laughs> your VANs, right? Remember your vans, right? Veins, arteries, and nerves. Those are the ones that are they're talking about in terms of your thoracic vessels, right? That's going in terms of giving mus um, innervation and blood supply to the um, muscle slash cartilage of the thoracic wall. Then there's the parasternal lymph nodes. For those who need your cumulative knowledge to be tested, parasternal lymph nodes are involved with what metastasis? All right, cricket chirps. I know it's, I get, I get three what? second rule. What's that? Breast Isn't tissue, yes. Perfect, nicely said. Um, it is uh, breast cancer when it metastasizes to the um, to the other breast tissue, whether it's on the right to the left or the left to the right. Um, it's like involved in 25% in terms of spread. Um, most of the times they like to ask about the anterior one for those cumulative information. Now the middle mediastinum, this is kind of like the big honking, hella important one, right? Any sort of damage to this is the one that you're going to be more concerned about because what can be messed up? A whole bunch of vasculature, a whole bunch of cardiac level stuff. Like seriously, pull it to this place. You're basically calling it TOTD, right? Time of death. Posterior mediastinum, esophagus, thoracic aorta. Most of the time, what they like to ask about is the esophagus, right? Here is in the posterior. Obviously, you remember your, your oral cavity has to lead into the esophagus and the trachea, and then eventually it goes into um, your lower portions of your GIT, okay? I'm not going to cover your GIT because that's a term two problem, but I'm going to focus in on anatomy. All right, let's do this question. Yep, please, please look at first aid, guys. Um, as long as you guys go through first aid, a lot of the high yields that you guys are, you guys are going to getting from um, your from your from your lectures are going to be synthesized down to the essentials in first aid. Okay. Oh yes, firehouse med prep. Oof. Literally, I use it every day. Like I, I have to figure out which um, material I need to kind of cover. So make sure you guys look at that. There's a link out in the drive as well to each of the terms material. So look at that when you guys can. I have her schedules like bookmarked and you just look every day. And if you don't know what to study, she literally has a study plan for you, like correlating first aid pages or sketchy videos or boards and beyond. Like if you're not quite sure what to do, that will tell you what to do. Facts. Um, especially for me, I've, I've like legit just ran through them. I'm like, I don't know what to study today. I'm like, well, you got to look at X, Y, and Z sketchy videos. Then you got to cover X, Y, and Z boards and beyond. And if you have no clue what's happening, look at um, first aid for sure. Alrighty, we had a good distribution. And this is the part that often trips up people. So let's look at the answer. So 60, oh, 67 year old woman presents to the emergency department with a cardiac arrest, right? Um, you guys can, you guys are seeing the pacemaker and it, what you need to identify is actually where it terminates. And you're like, well, what am I looking at here? Um, a lot of people were tempted by the left ventricle and I completely understand why. But if you guys are seeing, it's sticking to the, the more right-hand side of the heart, right? Look at this little boot-shaped heart, right? It's so cute. It's like a little like Ugg boots. Okay. Um, anyway, the node essentially ends here, which is in the right ventricle, which is the correct answer. And this is often very confusing for a lot of folks in terms of where everything goes in terms of um, breaking up the heart. Make sure you guys remember um, in terms of your pacemakers and other stuff, they're going to prefer to put it in a ventricle um, or in the atrium. First thing they're going to like to do is mess with the atrium because of the fact that you have your SA and AV nodes that they can kind of tweak to make sure that your pacemaking capabilities are functioning well. If they can't do that, then they're going to put it in a ventricle and then stimulate it directly via electrical signals. Okay. This is a tough question. I wanted to throw in there just to kind of test your guys' knowledge. <clears throat> All right, let's do a quick quiz. Um, now, 
the parts of the pericardium can be quite difficult for a lot of people. Um, it, it's understandable, but I'm going to make sure you, you guys know this one cold. Um, the answer for the last one was actually, look at where the node ends, is actually ends in the right ventricle, right? Look at where the tail end of the node is. Yeah. Okay, pericardium. Sorry, I had a private message, so that's why I'm trying to cover it again. Pericardium, different layers. What you do essentially need to know is that um, two, well, well, let's just kind of start off with one. Um, one is basically like the connected tissue, right? You, not, nothing serious going on here. Let's start off with more so of two, which has the fibrous pericardium. Not hella important. All you need to know is that innervation from that comes from a branch of the phrenic, right? In, sort of, in, in terms of referred pain, it can go to the shoulder. That's just a little bit of tidbit, okay? Now, the more important portion is the serous layer, which is the third one, right? It's the parietal layer and it has the serous, right? Kind of pericardium. That's where you're getting the production of fluid, right? And it's really important that you guys know that because the fluid production is what makes sure your heart doesn't cause these pericardial friction rubs, right? Those friction rubs are bad. That means it's telling you that there's some kind of bacteria or you have some kind of changes to the vasculature. It can be a whole host of things. You guys don't need to worry about pathology. We do. But when you guys get there, just a good tidbit of information. The pericardial cavity is where this serous fluid just hangs out and makes sure that you don't like, you know, um, cause these frictional rubs and damage the heart. Then you have your visceral layer, which is the last layer. Um, and it's basically connected to the outside portion of the heart, okay? That's essential tidbits. I'm gonna make sure you guys run through that. Here it is. Remember potential spaces, the pericardial. Remember the Beck's triad, okay? Beck's triad is high yield. You have to know all of these three components, cold, hypotension, distension, uh, distant heart sounds. Because remember, if you're putting a stethoscope to a patient, it's like trying to hear the heart sounds through liquid, right? It's really hard if you have more liquid kind of wrapped around your pericardial kind of space and cavity. So bad, bad, really bad. Okay. And then distended neck veins, um, this kind of like is hard to kind of identify in like patients, but obviously if you see it, you'll see it because it's distended like major. Now let's look at Beck's triad, but first let's do this question. Final seconds, make sure you guys click in. Don't worry, you only have to get 50% right, just like IMCQs, and you'll be okay. I'm just kidding. I just want to make sure you guys get some Halloween spooky vibes. I'm just kidding. Yes, it is. Actually, let me look at the distribution again. My bad. Um, you guys were a bit confused on this. What you need to know is that the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium is the one that's involved with creating the space, right? Which is the um, pericardial cavity where you're looking at the hallmark signs of Beck's triad, right? Patient comes in hypotensive, right? They have a elevated jugular venous pulse. Um, extremities are cold because remember heart isn't pumping out enough blood. Auscultation's messed up, like everything it's Beck's triad that's kind of giving you um, the key thing. What's really happening in Beck's triad, it, Beck's triad doesn't have to just come purely based off of trauma. I just want to emphasize this, okay? Most of the time, you often see it in the ED because of the fact that there's trauma, gunshot wound, et cetera, but it rips through the pericardium. The blood doesn't know what to do with it with itself, so it starts filling the pericardial cavity, and eventually it's going to squeeze the heart to not do its function, right? And I'm going to cover that with you guys in a hot minute. But it's not D, parietal pericardium and the fibrous pericardium. Fibrous doesn't really make anything, right? 
Um, it's just involved with kind of the outer projection of the pericardium, right? What you do need to know is that the visceral and the parietal, that's the space, right? And the serous is the one that produces the actual um, fluid, okay? All righty, here is Beck's triad. Like I mentioned, if I've mentioned it twice, you know it's going to kind of show up on the exam, okay? Distant heart sounds, elevated JVP, hypotension, right? Fluid is in the pericardial space. It's located between the visceral parietal, the visceral and the parietal layers, right? And the serous portion is like, I like to think it's like, it's seriously involved in creating fluids. Like it's seriously involved in creating fluids, okay? So that's the um, pericardial fluid that helps make sure that your heart is working normally and doesn't like rub up against the um, other portion, okay? Like Kate said, Three, four, five keeps the diaphragm alive. I just want to emphasize that here, this little picture, high yield. Okay, know this one cold. Okay, the clinical note, this is important. Pericarditis, um, we've actually learned about this very well, um, Kate and myself, because you can have changes to the heart based off of non, um, like, trauma level thing, right? It can be due to infections. You can have renal failure, which changes the osmotic um, activity of your actual blood. And that can lead to more kind of fluid production or lack of fluid. And that can cause frictional rubs. Post myocardial infarctions, we've seen these. Oof, I did not miss those days. And post-surgical, right? That's very common. Um, you can have a friction rub resulting from this. Pericardial effusion is the opposite of pericarditis, right? Effusion is the excess of fluid moving into the pericardial space. Common cause of it is pericarditis, connective tissue diseases, and hypothyroidism, right? Um, whenever they say a boot-shaped heart, it is a buzzword for pericardial um, effusion, okay? Boot-shaped. Let's do this one. This one's a bit difficult because I was tripped up on it back in the day. Let's see how you guys fare. All righty. I expected this. Don't worry. I actually picked all of these answers when I was doing it myself. Trust me, this is not easy stuff, okay? Um, but the correct answer is D. Now let's kind of run through this. So let's identify stuff because I hate just telling you guys, you know, memorize stuff, okay? First thing you guys need to know is that this giant chunky thing, this is the ascending aorta. And you're like, wait a minute. Wait, where am I looking at this patient? Remember, with all of your imaging, it gets a little twisty, right? Because of the fact that you're doing an imaging, like if as if you're viewing the patient from the feet side up, right? So if you're most of the time surgically or any times of anatomically, you're facing the patient. You're like, I'm never looking at the patient's feet. Like, what do you think I am? Like a like a foot doctor, like no way. Um, but what you do need to know is that when you're doing imaging, you're looking at the patient because remember the patient is moving into the imaging system um, head first. So everything presents like if you're viewing the patient through the, from the feet kind of angle. So that's important in terms of orientation. So we're looking at the patient's kind of diaphragmatic kind of space and it, well, from the diaphragm point of view, but if we're ascending a little bit above that. So what we're seeing here is the ascending aorta, which is this like white space right here. Then you're like, what is this? Like, I've never seen a portion of a patient that has like this random kind of doohickety thing next to the um, spinal column. This is actually the descending aorta. And you're like, wait a minute, ascending? descending? Like, is this a slice of the aorta? Yes, it's absolutely. This is at the aortic level. It's above the diaphragm. Um, and if you guys go a little bit below, and these are actually like, you know, lung fields that you're seeing, but you're not getting a good image because it's just a bunch of air in there. Okay. Now, what is this one? You're like, what, what sits right next to the ascending aorta? Yeah. You guys are like, yes, of course. It has to be the superior vena cava. 
Um, so this area right here is a superior vena cava. And you're like, what is this giant empty space that's here? That, my friends, are, um, of course, the bifurcation of the trachea, right? You guys see the split, right? Like how it's just like a giant chunky like black space. That's because there's nice thick cartilage around that area, keeps it nice and patent and allows for air to kind of move right through into the lungs, okay? And then, of course, E, of course, we're just talking about the fact that the esophagus is squished, okay? That's it. Um, here's the image, right? D is the aortic and pulmonary window, and that's the left recurrent laryngeal nerve that's extending beneath the aortic arch. So like you guys are seeing with the hoarseness and what Kate said, left recurrent, right? Any sort of hoarseness associated with that for now. Um, don't worry about the right one. That's for a later problem. Not right now. Okay. And you guys are good. And I'm giving you guys all of the layout. Let's do this question. I know it's quite difficult. These are not easy. And I shamelessly stole them from Amboss and their board preparatory material. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Ascending aorta is actually chunkier. Keep that in mind. Okay. Ascending aorta is a little chunkier. Um, if you guys look at that image again, I can go back to it after this question. The descending aorta is nice and circular. If you guys look at it, it just straight up comes down. So I'll, I'll, that's my little quick way of remembering chunkier kind of a weird shape um, as compared to like very smooth circular. It's almost like a perfect circle when you're looking at it. All right, you guys are 100% correct. Um, well, let's kind of go through it, but let me quick jump back to this, right? You guys see how big the ascending aorta is, right? It's a big vessel, right? It's a big elastic vessel because it has to deal with all the pressure of the systemic circulation and the heart ejection. Whereas the descending aorta is a little bit nice and circular, right? Right here. Just keep that in mind. That's how I differentiate it. I'm going to tell you guys, they will straight up give you images like this and ask you um, what's going on and give you like clinical vignettes like this. So you got to know these um, imaging cold um, before going to the exam for sure. Now, Patient reports episodic of heart palpitations. Auscultation reveals a hollow systolic murmur. Um, left fourth and fifth intercostal space radiating to the left axilla, right? That's radiating pain. Image study shows a compression of the anterior wall of the esophagus and the enlargement of which of the falling. Now, whenever you guys are doing um, the anatomy of the heart, you have to remember this essential thing. Whenever a patient comes in and they're talking about the esophagus being involved, it's actually the left atrium. And you're like, wait a minute. I thought the heart was like, like, you know, facing us. Like, it's like the left is like facing you as well. No, the heart is actually kind of like skewed. Like it's, it's turned over. And I'm going to show you guys that in a hot, hot minute, but the answer is a here. And I'll tell you guys why. Okay. So same question stem, but what you need to remember is that the esophagus is so close. Like you guys see, this is the left atrium. You see how the heart is kind of twisted, right? Some could say we're all a little twisted on the inside. So esophagus, right, is so close to the left atrium. Let's say a kid swallows like a razor blade. You can actually, oh, well, that's kind of a scary thought. Um, left atrium could actually be ruptured because of the fact that the esophagus is so close. It can be as simple as them swallowing a Lego. That's why it's so hard um, to keep an eye on kids because they can actually present with cardiac level issues if they swallow something weird. Okay, um, look at look at look at how it, the left atrium is kind of split right here. Now, if the patient comes in with a gunshot wound or some stab wound, what do you think is likely going to be messed up, right or left ventricle? Right ventricle, that's really important, okay? You guys need to know that the right ventricle is the most anterior facing component. If you're facing the patient, that's the thing that can likely get messed up. So as always, if it's food or something swallowed, and, and this is the reason why we can actually do a trans esophageal echo, right? You're literally shoving a ultrasound probe down the patient's throat and you're, you can see the entire heart and all of its layout based off of this tiny window, right? That you're getting into the heart from the esophagus, okay? Hella important, need to know what cold. Let's do this question.
Oh, um, let me cancel that and uh, restart polling because I'm not giving you guys enough answer choices. Bad quiche, bad. Whenever I say bad quiche, bad, I like to think of like Emperor's New Groove. I'm like, bad llama, bad llama. <laughs> Yes, I am still a child. I watch Emperor's New Groove. Hope I didn't give you guys the answer. Oh, there it is, okay. Well, you guys are correct. It's the aortic arch. And I fully trust that you guys knew because of the fact that um, people didn't click in before. I'm just kidding. Um, remember, this is the arch. So what we're looking at is actually the descending portion. If you guys see the little loop-de-loop, -loop, right? You can divide it right here. This is like the little division. This is the ascending aorta. This is the descending aorta. Fun fact, this is a term for problem, but I like to give you guys fun facts when I can. You can actually have an aortic dissection actually lead to a Beck's triad, right? Cool, huh? Yeah, anyway, but this is the aortic arch. So that's important that you guys know that. Cool, awesome. I just wanna emphasize this again. In terms of valves, you guys need to know that there's the pulmonary valve goes to the pulmonary system. You need to know that the right coronary um, artery and the left coronary artery are the branching points from the aortic vessel. So you guys got to remember, 4% of the heart's ejection and the volume of blood that's going to the system is actually given to the heart. 4%. It's a tiny percent because of the rest of the body needs so much of it, right? The kidneys, the guts, the brain. Brain gets 15, okay? Like, I'm telling you, brain is like, oh, like way too much needy, okay? It needs to relax a bit. Um, what you need to remember is that these valves are important, okay? The mitral valve, right, and the... Um, Tricuspid valve are very important. That's the ones that are involved with what heart sound? S1, S2, or S3? Put it in the chat. Mitral and tricuspid. S1, awesome, awesome, awesome. I love the chat when it blows up like that. Exactly. S1, remember that the S1 heart sound comes based off of the fact that um, these valves are closing. Then the S2 heart sound is, comes from the pulmonic um, and the aortic valve um, closing. So S1, S2. Okay, nicely done. Good job, guys. That's how you tell your systolic versus diastolic because right after the mitral and the tricuspid closes, you get your um, systolic and then you get your diastolic followed by the closure of the pulmonic and the aortic valves, okay? Now, you're probably wondering how the heck am I gonna remember all these valves um, based off of just their common name versus their like fancy smancy name. Okay, my little mnemonic is you have the right to try before you buy. So right to try. So right side of the heart is a tricuspid valve before you buy. And the mitral valve is the bicuspid valve. Okay, little dumb way of remembering it, but it helps me a lot. And what you need to remember is that these chordae tendinies keeps the heart um, valves essentially functional when you're having either systole or diastole and the ventricular and the aortic filling, okay? Whether it needs to be closed, they're basically like parachutes. They don't all, they, they give you a point, they give you a parameter by which it can stay open. And then after that, it will just snap shut, right? That's the really important part. Got to know that one cold. And um, for my anatomy buffs, what is the ligamentum arteriosum? Put it in the chat. What is that involved with? Please tell me you guys covered embryo. It's gonna make me cry if you guys have it. Exactly, ductus arteriosus needs to know that one cold. Make sure you guys cover it, hella important. And I'm gonna go over embryology with you guys in a hot minute. But for now, let's talk about the branches of the aorta. Just kidding, we're gonna talk about the palm, uh, about the heart vasculature that's really important that's coming off of the aorta. Remember that um, the primary ones that you need to be dealing with is the right coronary and the left coronary. Those are the major two divisions. Everything else is superfluous, right? Because they come off of them. 
Next, you need to know your LCX, right? And the nice thing is the name tells you what is happening. The left circumflex artery goes on the left-hand side and it circumflex or loops around the heart. Then you need to know um, your LAD. Why do you guys need to know your LAD? Why do you guys need to know your LAD? Most Remember commonly indicated in myocardial infection. Yes, that is the widow maker, okay? Whenever you guys hear LAD, I want you guys to echo in your brains, widow maker, okay? That is the one, if it shuts down, it basically um, doesn't give blood supply to the septum and the left ventricle, okay? So the division of the heart is messed up as well as the um, left ventricle is not functioning because it's a ischemic avascular event, okay? Your heart is like, shoot, I can't eject blood. Bad, right? That is big problem. MI is a big problem, okay? Need to know that one. That's the essential one. Everything else is just comes off of in terms of branching. Remember, there's a right-heartedness and then there's a left-heartedness. Don't need to worry about that too much. Just remember that the RCA arises from the aortic sinus, which is basically the aortic arch um, and via the ascending aorta. So it goes to the right atrium, SA and AV nodes. That's why you need to know your RCA. Okay, whenever they talk about any sort of arrhythmias that could be messed up based off of vascular changes, it's because of the RCA. Now, if it's the AMA, um, which is the acute marginal, it's talking about the diaphragmatic border, right? It's the border of the heart. So it's not hella important, but just need to know that um, it goes into the right ventricle. Nothing too big. Um, most often this isn't implicated in anything because it's a nice big chunky vessel that comes right off of the RCA. So it doesn't need to, um, it, it doesn't typically get occluded, whereas the LAD can easily get occluded. And I'll, I'll show you guys that. As always, LAD, right? Very important. Now the PDA, you're like, excuse me, why are we throwing PDA into this mix? Yeah, because it descends between the right and the left ventricle on the posterior surface of the heart. So if it's descending on the right and the left, if PDA gets messed up, it can also lead to an MI, right? And then finally, um, you need to know your LAD. I'm just going to emphasize that again and again. LAD was tested again and again on our exam. All right. Like I mentioned, LCA, LAD, territories where they go to, and the LCX. Most often, whenever they're asking you about anything, it's going to be the LAD, right? Because of the territory that it works with um, is very strict in its parameters, right? The left atrium and the ventricle, kind of really important for systemic circulation. If you have it occluded, Nothing's gonna really work too well, okay? You need to know that one very cold. All righty, let's do this question and hopefully emphasize another really important point. I do not remember the exact lecture number for the blood supply. Just make sure you guys cover it. Um, because these images are from AMBOSS, because the ones that SGU gives you are blurry, and I don't like blurry. I like 2020 vision, not the year 2020, because 2020 was just a hot mess to ES. All right. Yes, you guys are correct. Nicely done. I know you guys were slightly tripped up. Um, remember, we're talking about veins. And you're like, wait, Keish, you just covered arteries. What are you telling me about veins? The veins are kind of important, too, because this is how they like to ask those questions, right? The anterior interventricular artery, just after it rises to the left coronary, in exposing this artery for a bypass procedure, which accompanying vein must be protected? You're like, wait a minute, veins based off of arteries? Are you kidding me? Yeah, they, they like asking questions based off of arteries to veins, okay? That's just a second order question that they can throw at you. This is very important. Um, make sure you guys cover the great cardiac vein, right? As well as the middle cardiac vein. And if you guys know that they arise from um, the, the pulmonary component of it, like, because remember, this is the pulmonic kind of component of it, you should be good. Um, and the right coronary artery, right? RCA and then left coronary artery. I've all I bolder the essential ones you guys need to know cold, like the main branches based off of um, what they run with. So make sure you guys associate these. They will ask questions based off of 
veins to heart, uh, to arteries, and then arteries to veins. Okay. All right. Um, how do I teach this guys without getting in trouble? Um, all physicians take money. Okay, that's the that's the clean version of that mnemonic. So we're just gonna run with it. You're like, wait, what are you talking about? One is talking about all. So wherever you're hearing the first um, aortic valve kind of changes in terms of auscultating point, you're gonna be doing the aortic valve auscultation at the second right, okay, right. Important that you guys remember that it's the right-hand side, intercostal space. So fun fact. Um, Keish was learning to do these auscultation sounds on my grandma and she doesn't have too much kind of like, um, skin cause she, you know, she's, she's an older lady. So I just basically like counted each rib. And then I was like, I heard the, I heard the aortic valve close. And I was like, oh my God, Eureka. Like it was like hallelujah started playing in the background. Like it was, it was a great moment. Um, so this is actually true. You guys can test it on yourself if possible or parents or siblings and hopefully not your pets because it's going to be really hard to find their second intercostal space. Please don't auscultate your dogs. Just saying. All right. Um, the next thing to note is the pulmonic valve, right? You're like all physicians, right? So pulmonic um, is the second left intercostal parasternal. Remember, this is talking about the fact that these are just auscultation points. This isn't where the valves are directly located. Okay. Just keep that in mind. You're just hearing the valves open and close based off of location, right? Then take, right? Tricuspid is at the fifth left intercostal, um, parasternal line. Okay. Parasternal meaning, um, parallel to the sternum. So that's how I like to break apart the words and remember them. Then the mitral valve is the fifth left intercostal mid clavicular. You're like mid clavicular. What do you mean? It's mid clavicle, right? So you count down until you get to the fifth, uh, rib and right below it, you're like, Oh wait, there's like a little space. Yep. That's where you want to check your mitral valve. All physicians take money. Um, there's other kind of mnemonics that I can't mention because I'm on recording. Um, so we're just going to run with it. But you guys are feel free to throw it in the chat because that's not recorded. Um, now, you're like, how am I going to remember this? Well, first, it has a nice mnemonic of saying APTM, apartment M, right? 2255, right? 2255. And if you guys associate the numbers, and you should be good, right? Apartment M. Um, 2255, which tells you like you're, you're, you're an apartment complex M location or apartment number 2255. Um, okay. All righty, let's do a question. And trust me, that little mnemonic has saved my butt so many times. I can't even tell you. Also, happy a Halloween. I don't know if I mentioned this already. I didn't even realize this was Halloween weekend until like someone reminded me. Welcome to med school, guys. Me. You forget? <laughs> yeah, it was Kate. There you go. See? I was like, wait a minute. It's Halloween. We were talking about how we were sad we couldn't go out for Halloween. And Keyshore goes, it's Halloween. <laughs> I if someone didn't remind me it was my birthday. I'd probably forget too. because. Like, I have no idea like holidays and honestly my weekends are like no lecture days that's what they're considered yes i'm complaining i know um the physician detects a systolic murmur and you're like wait systolic i don't know all of these heart sounds and what's what's he talking about well it comes it confirms a valvular stenosis and what chamber of the vessel receives blood that's being injected through the narrowing and you're like, mm, this is pretty tricky. And what you essentially just needed to know is that everything comes from the aorta, right? If there's any sort of narrowing, right? It can likely be from the aorta, right? All of the vasculature that's going to the heart, aorta, right? Let's do this question. Someone asked me where if a patient's arm hurts, what's it about? Now you guys get an answer for it. See, I can't give you guys all the answers. That's just not fair. I mean, you guys already have this PowerPoint, so to be fair, you guys technically have the answers, but like still makes it fun. 
It's like knowing how a book ends. You gotta read through it, you gotta figure it out. Ugh, sublingual nitroglycerin. Kate, you remember that? <laughs> yep, I don't wanna remember it either. <laughs> All righty, so the answer is intercostal. And you're like telling me like, wait, what? Like, I thought we were talking about phrenic. Like you were telling me phrenic, you liar. No, it's we're, we were talking about the fact that it was your left shoulder. Very, very big anatomical difference, shoulder to arm, okay? Um, important to note that the if it's the left shoulder, you guys need to know that it's phrenic involvement. So you're thinking heart pathology as well as um, lung pathology right? Pathological changes. Now, if it's talking about specifically left arm or the axilla, which is the, your armpit, um, if it's hurting there, you have to start thinking about your intercostal brachial. And you're like, wait a minute, there's two innervations? Yeah, because the heart is so important. It hogs all of the innervations. So this is referred pain once again, right? The phrenic is going to be involved um, as well as the intercostal. It can be both involved, but for now, just associate if it's arm pain, Know, know, know that it's sub, um, it's the intercostal brachial because of the fact that the pain is radiating to the arm area. This is the classic thing. Like patients are like, oh, my chest hurts. And then my arm hurts. And I'm like, dude, you're getting, you're having like a myocardial infarction. Like, please go to the ED. Cardiac pain, right? It's a referred pain at the T1 to T4 level. And you're like, wait a minute, dermatomes again? Yes, you guys got to know your dermatomes. They will ask questions on the T2 component of the intercostal brachial know that one cold. Okay. Um, and then you just need to know that intercostal brachial T2, very, very high yield. Okay. In terms of heart pain, as well as um, radiating to your arm. Okay. Very, very important. Remember these are running based off of visceral sensory, right? That's why it's not somatic pain. Someone stabs you, you're like, ouch, it hurts at that location. That's because it's somatic pain. There's innervation that's very specific. Whereas your other pain fibers run through, um, well, for my NB folks, you guys will know all of the pain fibers associated with that and the tracks involved. It runs through the ALS pathway, right? Um, and that's why the pain is referred pain here rather than somatic pain, okay? You guys know all of this for my term twos that are crashing this review, okay? Let's take a kind of a look at the functional innervation. Remember that the innervation to the heart is run by both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, if I told you that the patient has um, bradycardia, right? What kind of uh, innervation is gonna be involved in terms of autonomics? Is it gonna be sympathetics or parasympathetics? Bradycardia, put in the chat or shout it out. Parasympathetic, perfect, nicely said. Remember, associated based off of function. I'm, I'm a firm believer of not just memorizing random facts because it's never gonna stick in your head two years down the road when you have to take a board exam. So learn it based off of the fact that the vagus nerve has primary innervation going to the atrium, right? Atrium, and you're like, wait, what part of the atrium? The SA and the AV nodes are primarily regulated by the parasympathetic, right? You can give drugs to patients that disrupt the vagus innervation, right? From the T1 to T4 level so that you can shut it down, right? You can, you can make their heart beat faster because you're changing the conduction velocity um, and the innervation going to this, okay? Whereas the sympathetic, you guys know, you guys, you guys pop some caffeine when you guys, you know, join this review. That's your sympathetic innervation, right? That's coming from um, your postganglionic kind of cardiopulmonary cardiac plexus fibers, right? They're going directly to the heart. And the heart actually has SAAV node innervation here as well. But um, in, whenever they ask questions, they like to ask about sympathetics based off of ventricle, right? Whenever you think, whenever you take coffee, whenever you drink coffee, what really happens to your heart is that um, your cardiac contractions actually increase. Your cardiac output increases because your body's like stimulating sympathetic response, right? It's like your body's thinking, oh shoot, I have a whole bunch of cyclic AMP. Like, what am I going to do with this? Well, I'm just going to make your heart beat real fast and give you heart palpitations. So that's what I'm feeling right now, which is cool. Um, remember that it, it also works by innervating the SA and AV nodes. It also messes with the ventricle cell muscles, and we're going to cover conduction velocity, ionotropes, um, and all of those later on. 
just giving you guys some brief kind of cardiac physiology introduction. All righty, the dreaded physiology. Now, I'm going to give you guys a quick break now because we've been going for about an hour now, and I, and I don't want to exhaust you guys too much. So I'm going to take a quick pause, and I'll, I'll pause to answer questions as well. Let's resume this party. Okay, welcome back, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed your break. Um, and I answered some questions in the meantime, um, but don't worry. We're going to cover the rest of cardiac physiology with you guys together. Okay, first thing to note, remember the conduction of the heart starts based off of the nodes, right? You're like, wait a minute. There are other things that regulate this. Yeah. I, I, believe it or not, the cardiac conduction system is very unique because it, it, it relies both on the nodes, which are neuronal innervation, as well as um, muscular kind of contraction. Because think about, think about your skeletal muscle. Your skeletal muscle can be conducted via sodium, potassium, and all those stuff, right? Whereas your atrial kind of SA, AV nodes are conducted by a completely different system. So, but they cross communicate in the heart. And that's why it makes the heart skeletal muscle, not skeletal muscle, the cardiac muscle so unique because the conduction system is dual as compared to what you see in the skeletal muscle. Okay. I'm just going to emphasize that. Um, learn it based off of the heart and you're going to understand it much better. Okay. So action potential, where does it start? It starts at the atrial systole, right? And it's because of the nodes. SA node is also known as the pacemaking node, right? Everything starts from there and it goes and distributes to the rest of the heart. So atrial systole leads to isovolumetric contraction. You're like isovolumetric. Let's break apart the words. Iso, right? Same. Volumetric, meaning volume, contraction. You're like, wait, why would we want to contract something that's the same volume? It's because we want to make sure that sufficient... Um, amount of blood that's going to the ventricle is equivalent to the amount that needs to be ejected, right? We don't want too much of it going. We don't want too less. It depends on the event that you're working with. Right here, after atrial systole, you're getting your first S1 sound. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mitral and the tricuspid close. So isovolumetric contraction, that's when the ventricles are prepping. They're prepping for, it's basically like, a, like an expansion that's leading to what you're seeing um, with the amount of ejection, right? The rapid ventricular ejection, followed by the actual ejection event. Then your valves have to close, right? If they don't close, you're going to get um, regurgitation. You're going to get all sorts of other um, wonky stuff. That's when you're hearing your S2 heart sound. Then you get your isovolumetric um, ventricular relaxation, right? And we leave a little bit of volume in the ventricle because remember I told you guys, a portion of the muscle um, especially cardiac muscle is involved with the conduction based off of what is actually maintained in the, um, in the, in the blood, right? The blood has certain ions that helps kind of conduct the system. And then you get rapid ventricular filling, like I mentioned before, and then you have reduced ventricular filling and finally atrial systole, right? It's like a whole cycle, right? Hakuna Matata. Okay. It's driven by the SA note. Key, key thing. Now, you're like, oh boy, here it begins, the Wigger's diagram. Remember, the pressure that's generated in the right ventricle is much less than the left ventricle. And you're like, well, that's cool and all. I'm not going to remember it during the exam. You will, because of the fact that the left heart is systemic circulation. It has to generate a lot more pressure so you can eject blood and overcome all of the pressure that's at the aortic level. Because remember, your aorta isn't just hanging out like willy nilly, just relaxed and like a chill dude after an exam. It's, it's filled with blood and it has to overcome that pressure because it's basically all of the systemic pressure that's in the system. Okay. Whereas your pulmonary system is very low vascular resistance. Now, as good young doctors that you guys are, when do we actually see pulmonary system having increased vascular resistance? At what stage in life? Throw it in the chat. Make sure you guys make these connections because I hate memorizing. When do we have increased pulmonary vascular resistance? At what stage in life? Fetal, absolutely guys. And really important, Where, if you're a fetus, are you breathing? Are you, are you taking big old gulps of air? Please tell me now. Okay, yes, it is dough. Yeah, you're not breathing. Um, everything that you're getting is by diffusion from the mom. So the pulmonary system is essentially flooded with amniotic fluid. 
And there's an important function that you, you learn with amniotic fluid and how the lung develops because of it. So vascular resistance is very high then. Now, when you guys, you know, eventually lead to um, being born and, you know, taking the, your first gulp of air, that's when the pulmonary vascular resistance changes. So the pressure that your heart has to generate to overcome the pulmonary circular resistance is very little. That's why in terms of anatomical structure, your left ventricle is so much chunkier compared to the right ventricle. Okay. Very simple. I like to take anatomy, physiology, smush it together, make it into anatomy, physiological morphology. There we go. I like squishing words together. Cardiovascular structure. Okay. Remember left atrium in terms of pressure wise, it's kind of given here. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the, I think first aid version of this is different. So make sure you guys learn it based off of this. Okay. You've got to know the systolic diastolic pressure based off of what SGU gives you. When you guys are taking your board exams, don't worry. You can memorize that number for now. Just know these numbers based off a of left ventricle is 130 over 10 and the aorta is 130 over 90. And then it makes sense because when we eventually get to the overall mean version of all of this is 120 over 80, right? It's just kind of all divvies out. Okay. Memorize this number, unfortunately. Okay. Ah, Wigger's diagram, the dreaded, dreaded Wigger's diagram. What I'm going to emphasize here is that you need to know that the X axis is pretty much the same everywhere, right? It's time. It's this entire kind of cycle, right? Whereas the X, well, X axis is time. And then the Y axis literally changes from every section. It can be pressure. It can be volume. It can be, you know, your electrocardial activity as well as the heart sounds, right? So that's what's all given here with one giant Wigger's diagram. If you look at a Wigger's diagram of a patient, which you never will, because no one really generates like giant reports of this, um, because this all helps you with theory, but your EKG tells you most of the stuff that you need. Here, it tells you what is happening with the contractions, right? Um, so make sure you guys line it up. So what's happening with one, right? You're getting filling, right? And the pressure and the filling go hand in hand, right? So you're getting, oops, ooh, 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 hold on, systole. Let me kind of rewind here. Let's kind of break it apart, part by part, because I don't want to give you guys too much based off of one picture. So at one, you're getting mitral valve closure, right? It closes, it snaps shut. So what heart sound would you hear with your mitral valve closing? In the chat, please. S1. S1. Or shout it out. I like both. Um, I forgot to mention that. Remember here, when with the closure of the mitral valve, it's isovolumetric contraction right? Isovolumetric contraction. You're like, no change in volume. That makes sense. Because if you go back here, what do you see with isovolumetric? Everything kind of flattened out, right? Like there's no increase in volume, right? Very cool. Um, then you get vent ventricular P uh, pressure rapidly rising, right? Because the pressure has to build. Your heart is filled up with blood. It doesn't know what to do with all this excitement, right? And then eventually, like a birthday surprise, it leads to ejection, right? That is really important, hella important, okay? Um, that's what you're seeing here. Pressure rises, but the volume stays the same. That's isovolumetric contraction, right? And finally, when the aortic valve opens, you get your systolic ejection. And that ejection is what you're seeing here. Look at, the, look at the left ventricular ejection. It maximizes right here, and then it starts dropping. Now, when you get to three, that's when the aortic valve closes. This is really important, guys. This was an exam question. Everyone forgot what happens um, right here. And you're wondering, wait, what is this little bump in the aorta? That's when the um, volume, right? When the aorta actually snaps shut, right? The valve closes. Um, it's called a dichrotic notch. I hate saying that word because it's like, I have no idea why everyone spends so much time emphasizing it. It's because the pressure rises right after that valve closes. And that pressure um, is very unique. That little beep going up, that's really very important. Okay. Then the mitral valve opens right, right here at the fourth point, And that allows for ventricular filling. Again, this is the second cycle um, beginning, right? This is all based off of pressure. This, they will ask you questions about, you need to know every single thing listed here, giant heart symbol. This is cardiomegaly, you've got to know it. Now let's look at volume. Volume is critical because this is the amount that gets ejected out, right? 
Mitral valve closes, right? S1, right? Um, that is the S1 sound right here. And you get isovolumetric contraction, like mentioned. This is at the ventricle level, like the left ventricle. You see no changes in volume because you're just building up pressure, right? That's what we saw above. Pressure builds up. Just like how you guys are getting through this module. Pressure builds up. Volume stays the same. All right. Um, what happens is this is where the end diastolic volume is identified, right? The heart is in diastole, right? It hasn't gone into full-blown systole, right? This is how you identify in terms of filling. Now, aortic valve opens, you get systolic ejection. There's two phases to this, guys. There's the rapid ejection, which is what you're seeing here. Whee, it's like a slippery slide, go down very quickly. And then the rest of it is reduced ejection. That's like the smaller percentage that gets um, pushed out, right? That's because you're trying to retain some of the volume um, within the ventricle. Remember, you don't eject out all of the blood that's in the heart, right, in the ventricle. Some of it has to stay back to, in order to allow for um, cardiac conduction. Next, you get your aortic valve closing, right, which is at 0.3, right, isovolumetric relaxation. That's the, that's the re kind of polarization. And then this is where end diastolic um, and systolic volume is identified. Sorry, guys. Um, and then the mitral valve opens. That's the rapid filling, right? The cycle kind of continues. Remember, blood is coming in. That's why the um, volume is increasing right here. Okay, hella important. They will ask questions about this um, in terms of filling, pressure, et cetera, based off of each other. Okay, to my T2s and T4s who are here, um, we had to know this one cold. We were asked questions about this all the time. So know the P wave, know the QRS, know the T wave, know where the atrial contraction begins. Um, there's a fantastic video that I've linked out at the tail end that shows all of this um, in action and breaks it apart by Ninja Nerds video. So, okay, there you go. Dichrotic notch, like I mentioned, the little boop of um, pressure increasing the aortic right um, valve or not aortic valve, but the aortic arch. So that's the dichrotic notch that they always like asking questions about. Now, which two heart sounds are um, are physiological versus uh, uh, versus pathological? S1 and S2. Perfect. S1, S2, S3 can be normal um, in children and athletes and sometimes uh, pregnant folks. S4 is always pathological, okay? It's the atrial kickback, okay? That's not good. Whenever you hear an S4, you got to get the patient to like any sort of cardiologist because they got to do some serious intervention, right? They could have straight uh, palpitations, arrhythmias, heart failure, all sorts of nonsense. That's not good. Okay. No bueno. Okay. Run through this. This is the first aid picture. You got to know these um, images cold. Okay. The JVP, okay. Jugular venous pulse. I'm going to tell you guys um, it's, I'm going to cover it, but it's not the highest yield. Okay. The first half of the Wiggers diagram, you got to know cold. All right. Let's do a question. If anyone picks E, I want to cry. All right, this is the tale of two bars. Um, we are split between B and D, and I completely get why. So you're like, is it one to two or is it three to, um, sorry, oof, my bad. Is it three to four? So this is a little bit challenging, um, but let's kind of take a look at it. The answer is actually D, okay? So catheterization happens in real time and the measurement of the pressure and volume within the left ventricle is seen. Um, using the reference below, which of the following is the pressure volume loop corresponding to stroke volume? So stroke volume is what, guys? Is the amount of volume that's, is it staying or leaving? 
leaving. Leaving, exactly. It's N diastolic volume minus N systolic volume. You guys see why this equation comes in handy, right? You got to know this one cold. So it's the opening of the aortic valve, right? Seen, which is at the third position, right? Rapid ejection into the aorta, and then the aortic valve closes, right? You guys see the pressure change, right? The pressure volume loop changes. So that's why it's D as compared to a lot of folks who were saying one to two, right? Important, important, important. You guys got to know pressure volume changes cold, okay? So let's take a look at it, right? Aortic valve opens right here, right? Aortic valve closes, right? Um, if you guys go to Toledo's office hours, he will make you sing this entire diagram together, okay? You got to go to his office hours, I'm telling you. I hope Dr. Toledo is teaching you guys, right? Did you guys get his material? Yeah, God yeah. bless. Please <laughs> go to his office sing. hours. Made you guys sing? You guys better be singing. Yesterday, yeah. Good, yeah, yeah. good, 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 good. Um, I have I have dreams about M O M C A O A C like all the time. Okay, so make sure you guys know this. But let's kind of walk through this. Okay, so where do you where are you getting your end systolic volume? This is a it's a question that often kind of gets a lot of people. End systolic volume is right here, right? That's where the mitral valve closes. You guys are seeing the left ventricle pressure, um, and you guys are seeing the volume never changes, right? It's isovolumetric, right? Systolic is the ejection kind of component, right? Um, the diastolic component is the amount that's remaining during rest, right? That's an isovolumetric kind of component as well. So that's EDV. So important that you guys know this. Remember, ejection fraction is always tested heavily, and normally it's 0 0.5 or 0.55, and it's about 55% in terms of ejection. We don't actually eject out all of the blood that's brought into the ventricle. So let's kind of run through this. MO, right, the mitral valve opens, right? Ventricular filling, right? And filling happens, happens, happens. Mitral valve closes. Um, then it leads to isovolumetric contraction, right? Volumetric, right? That leads to pressure building, but volume stays the same. Then the aortic valve opens, right? As the volume peaks, then you get ejection, and then you get aortic valve closure. Okay, that's the ejection kind of component. So you got to know that one. And then you get isovolumetric relaxation. So where is all of this happening in the right or the left ventricle? It's the left ventricle. Got to know that one called, know that the stroke volume is associated with this and how you can calculate it. And they just straight up gave this and they asked us if the patient has stenosis versus regurgitation. So no, got to know this one. All right. Question. Madeline. Yeah, I just have one more question. So I know that the stroke volume is that end, end diastolic minus end systolic. So how come mm -hmm. that's autumn one again from like one to two? How do you have, put it? could you mind just explaining that one more time? One to two. Oh, here, 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 here. Um, the numbers were, okay. That's because we were talking about ventricular ejection, right? That's what we were asking about here in terms of changes to the pressure volume of corresponding to stroke volume. Um, stroke volume is going to be more so um, associated with, oh, shoot, this was mislabeled. It was actually B. Okay, my bad. Okay, that was all me. Um, make sure you guys remember this. This is my bad, straight up. I think that the when I was trying to animate this, this was supposed to go to one to two. Sorry, my bad. Um, I had to pull this up via PDF, so I didn't move. I'll make sure you guys get the updated copy of this. It's actually B. Thank you for catching catching that, Madeline. No worries. Thank you so much for clarifying. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Thank you guys for identifying that um, and checking me. Because remember, I'm mortal too. I make these mistakes. Um, yes, we were looking at, um, in terms of volume changes, ESV, EDV. Okay, so that's going to be happening at this level. Right. Let me just make sure I had this right. She undergoes cardiac catheterization, pressure volume changes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So it's one to two is what we'd be concerned about. Yeah. Let's look at turbulent versus laminar flow. Okay. This one is really important. Um, quick question, guys. Patient comes in with atherosclerosis. James, do you feel free to jump in and, um, why why you think it's D? I see that you said D.
Um, because um, stroke volume, I thought stroke volume was um uh, was in relation to um three and four, like um ventricular ejection. Ventricular ejection, right? Because that's what I thought too. I thought I had mislabeled this, so um. Can just double check this one um, on your guys' notes in terms of ejection versus not, um, because I always thought it was ejection. Okay. Yeah, that's um, stroke volume. That is stroke volume, right? So it's um, stroke volume, EDV, and then ESVs, right? So because like you're you're more focused in on like the amount that's leaving and um, versus staying. So. Stroke volume is volume ejected over a period of time, but ventricular ejection is volume leaving in one pump. Perfect. Thank you guys for clarifying say, that. If they said like two, if they said two minus one, then that would be stroke volume. Like mm. if the I asked the choice said like uh, one, uh, two minus one, and not just one two two, uh, then it would be, be but it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, this is what happens. Um, I look at, uh, we haven't covered this once again, so just make sure you guys um, go review this. It's always a difficult kind of concept because it throws off a lot of people. I learned it based off of disorders. That's why I didn't spend too much time kind of covering it. But for now, I just want you guys to know based off of the vowels as well as where you're going to identify your EDV versus ESV. Okay. Know this one very, very, very well. Okay. Because of the fact that they're going to give you changes based off of what? Based off of if it's a stenosis, if you have um, calcification, so on and so forth. And I'm going to cover those with you guys. Now, turbulent versus laminar flow. Quick question. If you have atherosclerosis, what are you going to have? Um, turbulent flow or laminar flow? Turbulent. 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 Perfect. Okay. It's turbulent flow. Um, remember, this can lead to you forming clots. It's going to lead you to getting thromboembolized. Not good. Not good. Bad, bad, bad. Um, so remember, it's typically caused by valvular changes, right? So we're going to cover that just with, based off of this. You don't need to know this Raynard's formula. Don't worry about it. Um, this is typically caused by like a vessel obstruction. Atherosclerosis is the most common kind of thing. It can lead to kind of like um, ejection murmurs, carotid bruits, and other stuff that you guys can measure in terms of your OSCEs. Okay, let's take a quick question in the meantime. Let's, in the meantime, I'll look at my notes on this just so I can get this straight. Perfect. Um, that's what I like to hear. The answer is um, S1, S2 heart sounds, like, like the turning point ID is. And what we're likely hearing in terms of S2 heart sound is the pulmonary and the aortic, right? Got to know that one. S1, lub, right? Closure of the mitral and the tricuspid. And then S2 in terms of the pulmonary and aortic. Nice and perfect. Okay. Remember, um, if it's a older adult and they hear an S3, not good, okay? But if it's an athlete or a, like a pregnant woman, it's completely normal. Remember, early diastolic can happen with this, okay? Question, Madeline? Oh, I think that might have been from before. You're good. Okay, perfect. Um, S4 is always pathological. If you see an S4, you got to get the patient to a cardiac cath lab, okay? Not good. Um, normal splitting, right? This can typically happen due to like pressure changes, not a big problem. Widen split, that's when you get problematic stuff. Pulmonary stenosis, um, right bundle branch block. Um, you guys are going to cover those based off of EKGs. And then fixed splitting is typically due to an atrial septal defects, okay? Atrial septal, you're like, wait, it's going from which part to which part? You got to just know that it's a left to right shunt, right? Because remember, the pressure in the left atria is higher than the right, okay? Because remember, um, blood flow is always heavier and stronger on the left as compared to the right, right? It's very passive when you're thinking about the right heart. And then 
paradoxical splitting, whenever you guys think about it, you need to know what based off of aortic stenosis and left bundle block, okay? If you guys hear these hard sounds in terms of splits, you got to know these divisions. Um, it helped me a lot when I was going through CPR. Murmurs, okay? Whenever you hear a machine-like murmur, what is your go-to answer? Machine-like murmur. Exactly. P-D-A, which is standing for what, guys? What does PDA stand for? Exactly. Patent ductus arteriosus. Got to know that one cold. Whenever you hear whenever you hear a machine like murmur, it's PDA. Okay. Now, aortic stenosis, right? It's crescendo, decrescendo. You're going to hear this one all the time. It's age related calcification. It can also be cancerous. This is dystrophic calcification of the aortic uh, valve. Mitral regurgitation can actually happen due to rheumatic fever. And we know rheumatic fever quite well in term four because it happens all the time. It's a hollow systolic murmur, right? Hollow systolic meaning it covers the entire kind of component. It's pan systolic in nature, loudest at the apex. Now you're probably wondering, oh shoot, how am I gonna remember all of this mitral regurgitation, prolapse, all of these components? What you need to remember simply is that it's based off of APTM, right? All physicians take money or like apartment M or whatever you use, it can basically tell you what type of um, aortic or pulmonic or mitral or tricuspid level pathology you're working with, right? That's how I made the jumps during the question stems in um, CPR. I didn't, I didn't spend too much time learning every single component of this because you're going to cover it again when you guys go through the second half of your time here at SGU, right? Tricuspid regurgitation, less commonly seen. Um, and typically it can also happen due to rheumatic fever, but like it's mostly right ventricular dilation. And that tends to not happen too often. Ventral septal, okay, this is bad. If you hear a hollow systolic harsh sounding murmur at the tricuspid area, that's not good. They have a VSD and VSDs are not a good look, okay? Diastolic murmurs, not too bad. These are aortic regurgitations and mitral stenosis. You're probably wondering, how am I gonna remember this? Um, I'm just gonna say Mr. Ass, um, sorry, Mr. Ass and then um, Mrs. Art. If you remember that and you guys are gonna be set for remembering all of this, okay? Now let's kind of break it apart. MR, which is mitral regurg and um, aortic stenosis go together, right? So that's a systolic murmur. Whereas Miss, which is mitral stenosis and aortic regurgitation is diastolic. So that's how I got through the entire systolic versus diastolic murmurs by that just very simple mnemonic, okay? Machine-like is the easiest one. PDA, congenital rubella, prematurity. It's even associated with like maternal diabetes and other stuff. So we're gonna cover that in a bit. Like I mentioned, all of it's kind of covered here. Um, and you guys will identify this based off of the murmurs as well as, um, you know, how it's gonna sound. Embryology, my favorite. Okay, the heart is kind of a hot mess, right? It twists, it turns, it creates all these like little openings. But remember, um, portions of it have to develop in a unique way, right? The patent foramen ovale is the most common type of defect, right? It's caused by a failure essentially of the septum primum and the septum secundum to fuse, right, during birth. Um, most often it's like not even identified. It's just going to lead you to the fact that, um, you know, they're typically asymptomatic in nature, but for us T2s and T4s, we've seen paradoxical emboli. Whenever you get an embolus, which is basically like a clot formation within your, um, within your blood vessels due to like you sitting down for too long or like not exercising enough, it can lead to multiple little um, emboli, which are just coagulated blood getting into the circulation and it can lead to essentially systemic um, issues, right? You can also get like shunt changes. We're gonna cover that in terms of ASDs and BSDs. But for now, just know that the most common one is the patent foramen ovale, okay? Um, it's really hard to understand the primum and the secundum. There's a really nice osmosis video out there on YouTube, as well as like you can watch the Ninja Nerd video um, on this. And first, it has a nice way of covering all of this. You don't need to memorize every single detail. You just need to know ASDs and VSDs very well. Okay, this one scares everyone in terms of the aortic arch derivatives. 
Um, you guys don't need to know all of it. What you do need to know is certain components of it. The common carotid for my um, T3s, or sorry, not T3s, my T1s, right? You need to know that one. You need to know your fourth and you need to know your sixth, right? Those are the essential ones. For my T2s, you got to know your um, maxillary one, right? The first arch, first is maximal, second is stapedial. That's for my T2s. Branches given to you in a nice table format, I would memorize these, okay? We got quite a handful of questions on this, very important. Carotid arteries, subclavian arteries, and all of these um, aren't too crazy, um, but I will tell you certain ones are pathological in nature. So whenever you guys get sort of fetal kind of circulation further down, you're gonna see all of this. Like I mentioned, a certain um, shunting or circulatory changes are normal, right? Most of the time, your you, any sort of like hole in our body is not good, right? Like any sort of shunting from one location to the other is not good. For the fetus, you got to have your PDA and you got to have your patent foramen valve because remember, the baby isn't breathing, right? You want all of the blood in our body to go into systemic circulation based off of the, the fact that you get simple diffusion from the mother, right? The lungs are unfunctional. So the PDA is uh, common, the foramen ovale is common. So these are the ones you gotta, gotta keep in mind for neonatal circulation, okay? Ligamentum arteriosum, right? Um, need to know your ligamentum venosum, and then you need, well, I mean, you guys, when you guys cover um, term two stuff for the ligamentum teres hepatis, right? Because this is circulation that's coming from the mother so that you can get it into systemic, okay? Here it is in terms of shunting, ductus arteriosus, foramen ovale, and of course the ductus venosus, right? The nice thing is they all have ductus in them except for the foramen ovale, but you guys can remember foramen ovale very well, okay? Cardiovascular changes, here's the thing, okay? Important to know that when you take your first breath of air into this world, right? When you're when you're popped out of your mom and they get that beautiful picture of you screaming your lungs out, that's really important. Doctors are checking your APGAR scores, which is a score that you use to analyze if the baby is born normally or not, which is something my T2s will cover later on. It's really important because that baby has to take the first, first breath of air in and it changes a lot of pathological, or sorry, physiological changes to the baby's heart, okay? One, the flow of the blood is going to change, right? When the pulmonic vasculature dilates, it's going to lead to a giant change in the shunting, right? You're suddenly, your right side of your heart can fully function now. The next thing is when you cut the umbilical cord, you start, you, you, you stop releasing prostaglandins and prostaglandins are going to keep your patent ductus arteriosus um, open and when you stop releasing them, it can close them. Sometimes it stays open and that can lead to the machine-like murmur that you guys saw. So all of these physiological prostaglandins like you guys are seeing here, all of these are changing, right? And when you get the pressure change, the valve also shuts close, right? The foramen O valve, right? The primum secundum and the um, septum, or sorry, septum primum and the um, septum secundum, okay? Keep that in mind. And then finally, you know, Everything moves from, from the right to the left, okay? And that in terms of systemic flow. All right, I don't know why this chicken is dancing. Apparently, you know, your heart kind of twists and turns, but you got to know each of these based off of what they create. The trunk is arteriosus, the bulbous cordis, the ventricles, all of this, you got to know. You got to know what they create, whether it creates the atria, it creates the ventricle. They will ask questions about embryo much more heavily in this module than previous modules. Here it is in terms of what they create, right? Um, and you guys can run through this, but this is a pure memorization game. Um, and that's why you get a lot of questions with this because it's hard to kind of put it all together because the heart essentially twists around in order to create the different valves and the different um, atriums and the ventricle. The atrium um, is often just often uh, poorly understood because we spend so much time thinking about like the ventricle, but they will ask questions about this. We got a handful of questions about atrial septal defects based off of um, heart embryology. Okay. All right, you're like congenital defects. Okay, let's start off with the basic one. The primum type 
ASD, atrial septal defect, and membranous type VSD is associated with Down syndrome. This is a high yield, guys. It is very, very high yield. Down syndrome is associated with a lot of pathological changes. But for now, I want you guys to know the primum type, right, um, is associated with Down syndrome. I literally, I, I looked at these slides literally before I went into the exam because they had questions about this. And I, I was told by upper termers that this was high yield. It came back every time. Okay. Now, tetralogy of Fallot is also seen and PDA can also be seen with Down syndrome. Let's look at right to left shunts. Remember, whenever you have a right to left shunt, are you getting oxygenated blood into systemic circulation or deoxygenated blood into systemic circulation? Oxygenated or deoxygenated? It's deoxygenated. Perfect. Okay. Deoxygenated because remember, these are blue babies, right? The baby be blue. Okay. They looking, they looking like Loki when he was born, right? That's important. High yield. Okay. Blue babies, right? That's a buzzword and that's associated with cyanosis, right? Right to left, early cyanosis, high yield. It's associated with truncus arteriosus, right? Um, transposition of the great vessels, tricuspid atresia, and total anomalous pulmonary venous return. That's very, very high yield. All right. Now, if they tell you the baby squats and feels better, buzzword heavy for tetralogy of Fallot. So what really happens? The shunt quickly for a moment changes because of the fact that um, you have an entire kind of systemic changes or increase systemic changes to get the blood back to the heart. Now let's quickly talk about this. So what is what is the four components of the tetra? Tetra meaning four. Fallot is apparently a dude that was like fancy enough to get a disease named after him. So what you need to know um, is that tet spells, cyanosis in babies, and the four components associated with that is pulmonary stenosis, right? Stenosis meaning narrowing. That's due to a defect of the infantibular septum, right? That's the bulbal, bulbar septum, right? It's not properly like rotated. Um, remember, these essentially spiral in order to create the two different valves because um, remember the aortic and the pulmonary artery both originate from one giant vessel, right? Whenever you're thinking about your heart, everything was symmetrical in your body at one point, but when the aorta and the pulmonary have to be created, guess what? Stupid neurocrest cells, they didn't want to migrate, okay? They were just feeling like chilling out, okay? So they didn't properly spiral and leads to one of the tetralogy of Fallot presentation of the aortic and the pulmonary artery being separated. Now, the VSD is due to the ventral uh, ventricular hypertrophy because now so much of your systemic pressures are getting switched to the right-hand side because you have a VSD, right? That's really important. Plus, the narrowing of the vessel makes it harder for blood to be ejected. So the heart muscle basically um, hypertrophies. Hypertrophy meaning increase in size, right? Not in number. Because remember, cardiac cells, cardiac myocytes are permanent cells. They can't change. They can only remodel. And then you, overriding aorta. Remember, this is basically caused by when the um, interventricular septum is not divided properly. And it basically is shared between um, the right and the left ventricle. All right, persistent truncus arteriosus. I swear to you guys, this is the most annoying because your neural crest cells were just minding their own business, but they failed to migrate, okay? They should have migrated, but they didn't create a septum. And I told you guys, remember the aorta and the pulmonary valve are, not valve, but the aortic and pulmonary vessel are both originating from the same point. And the neural crest cells that are um, situated here are supposed to spiral. Right? When they spiral out of control, they help create the division between the aorta and the pulmonary um, vessel. When it's not there, then essentially you're going to present with mild cyanosis, and it's commonly seen in DeGeorge, and that's due to thymic involvement, and you guys are going to cover DeGeorge even more. And remember, it's 22Q11, right? It's a micro deletion at the 11th position. Let's do a question about this one.
What do you guys think this is? Let us see. What do we want to keep open? All righty. Yes, we want to keep the PDA open, right? Patent ductus arteria is open because what? It'll help the baby survive. Now, you're probably wondering, what am I going to give to these babies to keep it alive? Do you guys know? Did they mention it during lecture? Or maybe that's a term for it then. They, I think they, they must have put it in. Exactly. Prostaglandins. Um, eprostanol is one of the ones that keeps the um, prostaglandin levels artificially high, and that allows for the PDA to stay open. Eprostanol and like a bunch of other ones, but like you guys don't need to know that one for now. That's a T4 problem. All right. You guys are absolutely correct. PDAs do save lives. Um, now let's talk about the transposition of great vessels. You're like transposition. Um, it's because they swap, right? Now you're like having the aorta on the right, like the ventricular side. Um, and then you have your pulmonic on the left ventricular side. These babies will die ASAP. Okay if they don't have something else going on with them, right? Like another defect, they need to either have an ASD, VSD or a PDA, they will die. They will ask you this question. That's why I put a giant box on it and you gotta know it, okay? Once again, it's because the my, uh, migration of the neural crest cells, they do an absent or a reverse spiral. So everything swaps, okay? Um, also, if they tell you that mom has maternal diabetes, this is another thing. Right, this can lead to a transposition of great vessels. All right, um, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. You're like, wait a minute, what does that mean? It just basically the drainage of the pulmonary veins. Um, it goes into the systemic venous circulation as compared to, um, you know, the changes that you're seeing with uh, the you're seeing with the transposition of the great vessels. Okay. So what happens is that the baby is going to have severe cyanosis, but once again, like I mentioned before, it's, it has to be associated with ASD, VSD, and PDA. Otherwise, the baby will die right away. It just it, because look at it, all of the systemic values, all right, in terms of blood, um, is coming from the pulmonary levels, right, and that's going to the wrong side of the heart. So the baby is essentially going to become hella cyanotic. It's going to die if it doesn't get proper oxygenated blood, right? It's very common. Just know that it's a it's a thing. Congenital defects can essentially um, be normal, like the babies can be completely normal due to the fact that you can have a left to right shunt. Left to right, it's normal because you can have oxygenated blood going to the pulmonary system and nothing can really bad happen. It's going to be acyanotic, okay? But let's kind of talk about the ones where it can kind of reverse, but for now, let's talk about the PDA. Remember, it's associated with maternal congenital rubella. The mom is completely fine, but the baby gets affected by um, getting rubella, okay? Um, frequently associated with Down syndrome. Um, don't worry about the Down syndrome. Just know maternal rubella, think PDA, okay? Medication, prostaglandins, um, eprostanol, a bunch of other drugs that you can give to keep this open, right? The PDA, and it helps a lot with other um, uh, septal defects, right? Treatment, endomethacin, right, to shut it down if um, there's no other issues with the baby. Um, just remember that um, NSAIDs just are ones that shut down prostaglandin synthesis. And surgery is often done just to kind of make it into a, um, into a ligament arteriosis, okay? Eisenmanger syndrome. It's basically when your heart is like, well, I'm tired of like working on one side. I'm just going to swap. So what you what essentially happens is, you know, you're getting the left to right shunting. And eventually at some point, your right ventricle like becomes like a steroid buffed up hypertrophy dude. And it starts switching it, right? It's like, now I'm stronger than my left ventricle. So I'm going to send more cyanotic blood or not, sorry, deoxygenated blood to the um, systemic circulation. And this can present as blue kids. Okay. Blue kids is different than blue babies. Blue kids are associated with late cyanosis. Okay. It can be due to like ASDs, VSDs, and et cetera. Remember, it can happen at any location, but these are septal defects. All right, coartation of the aorta. This is associated with Turner syndrome. So give me the chromosomal composition for my FTM cumulative question for the day. Turner syndrome is what genetic composition? Exactly. 
Exactly. They only have one X. Exactly. So they're, they just have an X. So keep that in mind. They can ask um, cumulative questions with these. And it's going to be associated with um, either pre-ductal or post-ductal. Pre-ductal is actually seen with children, right? Little kids uh, or versus like um, post-ductal is seen with adults. So post-ductal, right? You guys can see where the ligamentum arteriosum is. That's what they're talking about, the ductal, right? Post-ductal is after it. That's seen in adults. They're not going to have cyanosis, right? Pre-ductal is going to be associated with children. So remember, Turner syndrome is, can typically cause this kind of defect. All right, collateral pathway. Remember, if you ever see rib notching, we're talking about coartation of the aorta. Why? Because more pressure due to the stenosis is leading to upper limb um, kind of changes, right? For example, the pulse is going to be hella strong in their radial pulse. But if you take a femoral pulse or uh, their pedal pulse, it's not going to show, um, it's going to be either intermittent or um, it's going to be weak in nature. You can also, whenever you see rib notching, oof, that's like, if you see that, you know coartation of the aorta, right? Buzzword heavy. All right, let's do this question. Okay, that's a very good point. Got to know the collateral blood supply um, whenever, wherever you see it. It's like high yield. They love that. All righty, what is this? Okay, we were a little split, I understand. Okay, um, it's auscultation reveals a murmur, transthoracic, right? Transthoracic echocardiogram reveals a heart defect, the atrial septal primum type. Okay, so we're talking about an atrial defect, it's a septum defect, and it's the primum type. Embryological failure, which of the following most likely caused this? This is very, very buzzword heavy. Um, whenever you think of primum, you have to think of the prime infusing with endocardial cushion. Okay, that's just associated with that. Um, D is associated with the septum secundum. The prime has to fuse with the secundum. It's like a flap. Okay, now that's a one-way valve. Like that, your your heart is essentially created like a fake valve to keep the baby um, from having to get too much effort put in by the right side of the heart because most of it needs to go into systemic circulation, and that one-way valve shuts it down so that only blood can go in one direction, which is systemic circulation, due to the fact that the baby has only diffused oxygen coming in from the other kind of um, defects, okay? Septum primum, endocardial cushion, foramen, prim uh, foramen primum, atrial communication between SP and EC, right? Which is all outlined here. This is quite difficult to understand. I, I, I completely get that. All you need to know is that the buzzwords associated with each of them is outlined here. Um, and if you have those memorized, it's just straight up a quick and easy two or three points on the exam, okay? Most of the time, VSDs tend to be more problematic. Often with these, right, the primum and the secundum, they are a, um, asymptomatic. So you might, you, you might go through your entire life and one day when you, you know, keel over and pass out, they might find that you have, a, you have an ASD, right? because they're so asymptomatic, they don't typically shunt reversal and do all of those things. VSDs tend to be more problematic in nature. All right, I was kind enough to find a whole bunch of random resources that I used back in the day and compile it for um, you guys here, which covers both the mediastinum anatomy, cardiovascular components, as well as any of the cardiac physiology. These are all playlists. Um, I really need to make sure I tell you guys that these are linked out. So you just have to hover over them and they're going to give you like a little YouTube link going directly to the videos that I used back in the day. I really found CK Med to cover a lot of the high yield SGU details as well. So feel free to take a look at that. Um, physiology, if you guys are struggling, make sure you guys watch my boy Ninja Nerd. Hella helpful. Okay. The videos are long. And so I put them off. I was like, I'm not going to spend an hour and a half watching this. And then I finally watched it and you guys 
but put in that hour and a half you will not regret it it will help you so much don't don't be shy because they're long videos they are but if you put them on like one and a half speed it's so worth it so don't be intimidated by the length of those videos facts seriously guys um it and i'm just going to echo this by saying like it covers like like three or four of your cardiac physiology lectures so that one hour that you're burning you're covering four lectures equivalent at sgu's level so just saying it, it's worth the effort that you're throwing into it okay all righty i'm gonna pause the recording any questions feel free to holler at me i'll stay a couple more minutes um and we will call it time of death